five. Uh, what does it mean that data is correlated, or there's correlation mm -hmm. between two values? Yeah, check it. It shows similarity in its points. So like similarity. What about <coughs> like are, how, how are points similar to each other? They have similar points on the graph. Similar points on the graph. I mean, all points are points, right? What makes a point similar to another point? As the x increases, and the y decreases. Maybe not the same amount every time. Okay. But by a little bit. By a predictable amount. Yeah. Right. Okay. As x increases, y decreases, what if x increases and y increases? So correlation, right? If, there's some, if you look at the, the, a scatter plot of data, it seems like they follow a pattern, there's predictability. As I move over this much in x, it seems like I'll go up this much in y. And not necessarily in a line. Sometimes uh, the points seem to take another shape, or maybe like a parabola or some other kind of thing. Huh? Some kind of a geometric, yeah, a shape of some kind. It seems like uh, I can predict what's going to happen in the y values if you tell me what happens in the x values. If you give me an x value, I feel like I can predict what the y value is going to be and be pretty close. So here, we're looking for a pattern, we're looking for predictability. Do you feel like there is any of that here? No, there's not. I can't draw any shape through these points, at least not the of any significance or importance. I can't draw, say, a line this way or that way. <coughs> they don't make a circle or anything. They just seem to be random, just scattered. Seemingly no correlation. Now, uh, you know, it could be maybe we're just looking at the data too closely. Like maybe if we back out and we, we take out, we take much, much, much more data, right? And rather than from zero to eight, from zero to a thousand, right? And instead of on the on the y-axis from also the y-axis from zero to eight, maybe from zero to a thousand on the y-axis. Maybe we'll start to see a trend then. But for now, in this small area, there's no correlation between these two pieces of data. Right. Let's see. Number nine, does it look like there's a lot of correlation? Yeah, they are very correlated. There is a negative correlation. Okay. Number eight, does it look like they're correlated? Mm -hmm. Kind of. A little. I mean, compare it to uh, five. You know? Yes. yes. It, it's kind of clustered together. It does kind of follow a, a little bit of a trend. It's just not as close as, say, nine or three or four. It's not as tightly packed. It doesn't follow as neat a line. But if we did draw a line through there, that stuff seems to be near that line. Okay. So I told you there's this number, it's called R. And this number R is just a, a numerical value that expresses how closely correlated these things are. Okay. And this number R is going to be between negative 1 and positive 1, and nowhere else. It'll be always between negative 1 and positive 1. Uh, if our correlation is a positive correlation, R will be positive. If it's a negative correlation, our R will be negative. Okay. And so, no correlation is zero. No correlation will be close to zero. That's right. Now, it'd be difficult to get exactly zero or exactly one. We're looking for closeness. Is it close to one? Is it close to zero? <coughs> Given the choice between negative one, negative point five zero, point five, and one, what do you think would be the R value for this correlation? Out of 0.5, you can see it's written right there, of course. But it's not quite zero, because it's not not correlated. It is correlated, but it's not very highly correlated. If I were to, if you were to tell me some x value, like 6, I might guess a y value up here or down here. I'd kind of be, be a big margin for error. If I were to write some equation for that line, I might be guess based on that. Does that make sense? What about over here? This this guy, I can try and cover that up. Yeah, good job. Um, what kind of correlation is that? Negative. Negative, Abby? I just had a question. Yeah. Since that 
was like, if it still looked like that, but was going like up the other direction, like if it started at zero and went up towards like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like Which one, eight or nine? <coughs> nine. Nine. It just kind of like flipped or something, like the points. So they go that way, up and to the yeah. right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Would that be like one? Yeah. If it, if we took exactly that and we just like made a mirror image of it so that it goes up and to the right, they're tight, they're close together. So it would be close to either one or negative one because it goes up and to the right, like the line that you draw through as a positive slope, uh -huh. it would be close okay. to positive one. Now, right now, if it's a negative slope, it's close to negative one. Close to negative one. Because it's a negative, it's negative because we have a negative slope from the line of best fit. And it's a negative one because when you're close to one or negative one, it means you're highly correlated. Okay. All right. Draw a scatter plot for this data. So one, <coughs> two, three, four, five. And the y axis needs to go as high as 62. Let's go up to 70. I want to draw a line that's really close to fitting that data, the line of best fit. Say it's something like that. that. Fair enough. It's not going to be exact, but it's always going to be a guess. It's it's guess after guess after guess. My my, my graph is hand drawn. My plots are the estimates. My line itself is an estimate. It's all just guesswork. This would be a, uh, a one correlation? Close to one. They seem to be pretty highly correlated uh, based on the few points that we have. A few, uh, yeah, a few data points we have. Um, okay, so now I need to find the equation of this line. A little bit more guesswork. I'm guessing at some points that are on this graph. Okay? Like, Maybe I'll choose this point because it's right above one, right? But it's not one ten, it's a little bit lower than that. So this point is gonna be about one what? Seven, eight, seven. Eight, seven, a little bit seven. And uh, this guy looks like it might actually be on the line just by chance. Okay, so I'll go with uh, 35. <coughs> Keep in mind, your line of best fit does not have to go through a point in the data. In most cases, it probably won't. If we're gonna be very, very exact. So now I have two points that are on this line, and now I'm gonna find the equation of the line of two points. Write the equation of the line, give me two points that it passes through. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus 35 minus seven over three minus one. Okay, so this is 28 over two, that's that's our slope, right? Now we have our slope, now what? What's that? Write the equation. Yeah, we have to write the equation. How do we do that? I'm going to move 14x plus crosses y. y equals 14x plus b. Okay. 
know that. That's a lot of things that I don't know in that equation. Uh, y, there's a y1 minus y n times n equals Oh, y minus y1 equals n times x minus x1. That's the point slope form. We're using the slope intercept form. We could do that too. We've already started down this path. Just wasn't really sure of that, so we have to plug in x and y. Plug in x and y. What's that? And solve for b. What can I plug in for x and y? You can plug in one for x and one for y. No, I want a point on the line. Oh. Right? So you do 1, 7? Yeah. Okay. 7 for y, 14 times 1 for x, b. So negative 7 equals b, y equals 14x minus 7. So don't think it's a bad thing that a lot of your graphing is kind of guesswork and you're just, like your answer's not gonna be the same as everybody else's. Probably a lot of your answers are gonna be different. But your slope and your y-intercept should be reasonably close to each other. So no matter what I do with all that guesswork, I should get a, a slope that's about the same and a y-intercept that's about the same. I don't, I should re-examine what I've done. Okay. Um, next we have, so that was 10, that was 18. Okay, so I said I've got a, has correlation coefficient r for which value of r the data points lie closest to the line. We kind of discussed this in the first few problems, so maybe we have some more insight. Which one of these r's tells me that the data is like the, the most highly correlated of all the four choices. Okay. Y A. It's close, close to, to one. Well, okay. To negative. Yeah. Close to one or negative one. Both are good. Negative one is not a bad thing. Negative. What does being? What does an R close to negative one mean? Is that really negative slope? That's. Correlated. Negative slope, but the points are highly correlated. They're very close to the line that you would draw through there. <coughs> so it don't have to be uh, 1.50 and then negative 0.5. And it can be just where, uh, like 0.96 or something like that. It can be that. Yep. Just close to one. Close. We're not, like, the only way that you could actually get one or negative one is if all the points you got were on the same line. Not close to on the same line, but on the same line. That would be a correlation. They're not right on the same line, they're just slightly off. Now you're not quite at one or negative one. You'd just be very close to it. How do you, uh, how do you tell, uh, like, how do you make your correlation? Like, if you just guesstimate uh, on what the correlation is? Like, how do you know what R is? Yeah. Uh, it could be calculated, but we'll, we use technology to calculate it. I'll show you how to. Um, let's see, that was 18, now 26. Right, so the diagram shows the boiling point of water various elevations across the rest fitting line to the data pairs where x represents the elevation and y represents the boiling point. Then use this line to estimate the boiling point at an elevation of 14 x. Um, So our x represents the elevation, so that'd be this stuff here, that's x, and y would be all these guys. Okay. 
So we need to go from uh, 2,000 to 14,000 feet. So if we made all of these 2,000, 2,000, 4,000. You see up six thousand. Two thousand, four thousand, six thousand, eight thousand, and twelve, fourteen thousand. Uh, our y values go from two oh eight to one eighty nine point eight. So, what kind of correlation is this then? The higher the elevation, the uh, lower the temperature. Lower the temperature. What kind of correlation is that? We're going to go from 189.8 to 08. Okay, so we're just going to kind of put a break there in the axis because we don't care about all the temperatures from 0 to 108. We're going to go from 108 to 208. 189 to 208. So make this So at 2,000 feet, we're at 208.4 degrees, boiling point. At 4,000, it's 204.8. So what is 2 across? 204.8 is with our line of best fit, what the temperature, the boiling temperature would be at 14,000 feet. How's that line? Should be good. good. It's not good, right? Should be a bit steeper. Uh, how's that? through the middle of the data. How's that? Good. That's pretty good. Okay. These, is, would you say that this data is highly correlated or not? Yeah. Very highly correlated. Uh, what would R be close to? <coughs> negative one. Yeah, we got this negatively correlated data. It's highly correlated, so the R would be close to negative one. It's just kind of a discussion point. Uh, What's that? I'd say that's about negative 0.98? Yeah. 
probability. Uh, in fact, when I go to write the equation of the line, it's so the data is so close that uh, you know it, it almost goes right through that point. And that point is not so nice. That's uh, four thousand and one ninety-seven point four. Or what is that? Four thousand and two hundred four point eight. Uh, just looking for points that seem to be like this one right here. Like the point that I wound up finally drawing was like that one, but this one looks like it's right on this grid. It almost looks like 10,000, comma, 193 exactly. So let's just use that guy. And then the other point looks like it's, oh, this one looks pretty good. Maybe it's 7,000, comma, 199. Okay. Two points. Now that we have those two points, I'm guessing at those two points being on the line, what are we going to use? What are we going to do to write this equation? Why is it marked by 1? 199 minus 193 over 7,000. So we get 6 over negative 3,000. That's 30,000. Mm. Yeah. Uh, let's just do 6 divided by 3,000. Call it negative. Five hundred. Negative 500. Yeah. 6 divided by. Oh, what, so 1 over. Wait. Five oh, yeah. 65 by 3,100. Wait, so okay. No. What is it as a decimal? One negative point zero. Why don't we just put five? One point zero point zero five. Six divided by three thousand? Why is it taking so long? Somebody has a calculator, I'm sure. They can take six and divide it by three thousand. No. Six divided by three thousand. What is it? It's room full of people who own couches. Two, two, two times. What is it? Do, do, do. I'll do it. <laughs> Six divided by three thousand. Negative. One zero zero two. All right. You didn't get. You didn't get. Oh. We got like two e nine or two e two e. I mean, it's I'm sure that you did it correctly, correctly <laughs> but the calculator is probably on some weird setting. It, it's on scientific. It jumps to scientific notation after three decimal places. So. All right, so there's our slope, uh, and we could do the same as before and say uh, say one ninety nine equals negative point zero zero two times x plus b. Oh, I forgot to plug in x. x is 7,000. Uh, plus b, we solve for b. 199 equals 0 0.002 times 0 0.02. 14. 14. 0 0.002 times 7,000. Negative 14. All right. Add 14 to both sides, and b is 200. The y equals negative point negative point zero zero two x plus two thirteen. Would you believe that? Mm -hmm. I mean, you found a slope, right? Does that, does that seem like a two thirteen is reasonable? What does two thirteen mean in the context of that line? Square across the y axis. Does it look like it crossed the y axis at two thirteen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. And close enough, right? It's not way off. It's not saying like a hundred or negative something. So my work. I believe it. I believe it. it. It seems reasonable. Okay. So, there's the equation of the line. We're supposed to do anything else? No. The boiling, the boiling point. At 14,000. 14, so, y equals negative point zero zero two times 14,000 plus 
plus equation would not be the same for everybody. Probably would be different for every person. Um, unless you're the kind of person who's, who forces themselves to use the points that are given, those are not necessarily going to be on the line that you draw. Keep that in mind. All right. um, I'm not going to have you find the, the line of best fit, at least on this homework review. Not everybody has calculators. Not everybody is 100% how to use their calculator to find the line of best fit. Okay. What I want you to be able to do is just check the reasonableness maybe of a of a line of best fit. Use that line of best fit to do things. So, like a problem like this won't be able to. Uh, well, on the homework review, no. On a test, I could have you, I would give you few da fewer data points. Oh, okay. You could guess at the line of best fit. Guess, that's fine. What we've just done, no technology used, right? Except for you have multiplication and divide six by 2,000, which takes a long time. Otherwise, it's all based on our eyeballs. Okay. Just drawing lines, guessing what points are on the line, using our skills and finding the equation of a line gives you two points. I'm not going to have you do a bunch of plotting points and things like that in a limited amount of time. Other questions? Let's pass it on. All right, so which of these equations seems to make the most sense for this data? Cross out D and B. And B. So why D? Why can you cross out D? Because it's a negative. Okay, we got negative what? We got negative correlation. Uh, negative uh, thing. Because it's positive correlation. So. Okay, it's positive correlation, so we shouldn't have a negative well, slope for the line of best fit. The line of best fit should be you know, something better than that, and it has a positive slope. So B and D are out. Good. Justin? It would be C, because if you took A, uh -huh. you already start at 50, uh -huh. and you're going up, uh -huh. and you're near 50 at the beginning, at 100. OK. Uh, so you're saying that we're, we're pretty close to having a point at Y is 50, way over here at X is 100. And if you plug in for the slope at 50, you're already at 200. Okay, so even if you just use approximations like 50 for the y-intercept, you can see this better on the previous screen, of course. Uh, that, that could not be too bad. I don't think that if I drew a line of best fit, it would go through there. But uh, maybe it's not so bad. But then if you had a slope of 3, I mean, let's see. You got 100, 200, 300, and over 100, like we're... Somewhere in there, we call it a slope close to three. Isn't that 
y-intercept, look at that slope. That's no good. Right? Too steep. Y-intercept, too high. So, by any number of routes we take, that makes the most sense. Makes the most sense that we have that y-intercept and that slope. Um, okay, well, I'm glad that this highlighting is very dark. So let's get rid of one way or another. Um, so, this is what I want you to do. I want you to, as you are also grading this person's homework review, I want you to have your notes out. It's clear we are having trouble with this. I am racking my brain how to help you. Okay, so let's take some notes on it. You can see here by that big red X and the fact that I said that it's incorrect. This is an example of incorrect graphing. This is a piecewise function. But it's also an incorrectness and an error that is pretty common. Okay. A lot of potential here, but it's just, it's not right. It's not correct. So, graph it, look at what's, what's good, what's right, and also what is not correct. Um, let's see, why do you think Ronan placed the closed green point where he did. So that closed green point is right there. Why do you think you put a point from there? Just as it says plus six. So the, equation the equation says plus six. And that plus six tells us what when we're graphing a line? The y The y intercept. That seems reasonable. Right? And why is that not correct? Because it's not the y intercept. Yeah, well, yeah, it's not crossing the y intercept. I don't know about the word we want to use. <laughs> well, where where are we not? Right here. What is this not? That's not the y-axis. The y-axis is not the y-axis. That's right. Okay. So yeah, that is the y-intercept, but we're not on the y-axis. We we are at x equals four. Why? How come? Why are we why are we over at x equals four? Because that's where the line is now for over here. Uh, for the uh, it's gotta be either greater or less than or equal to four. And so we right. have that just that's what creates the line right there. Right. So that's what that dotted line represents. It's just that break. That's the border between uh, between yes, uh, one uh, function to another function. Yes. The border between one function to another function. Exactly. Okay. Let me make this clear. Is this dotted line a necessary part of your graph? No. Okay, it is not. Also, because someone pointed out that, that maybe this was confusing. Is there any shading in this graph? No. The shading that I was doing before to help you see where you're supposed to graph this function, that shading was just to do exactly what I just said, show you where to graph it. You don't need any shading. Right? Notice I didn't. Whenever I talk about shading, which is for inequality graphs, I tell you exactly why we're shading. Why we're shading is in inequality graphs, not this graph, but inequality graphs. It's because that shading represents a bunch of points. In this example, when I was shading, the shading was just a color. The highlighting, it wasn't even shading, it was highlighting. Highlighting this area in one color, highlighting this other area in another color. So you can see which domain of each function. Okay. So, the absolute necessary pieces look more like this. It's still wrong. Right? You need to fix it. You don't need that line. We'll use it. It's a helpful guide. All right, so what's something that Ronan could do to fix his graph, given that he's confused about the y-intercepts? Uh, he, um, for the green one, he plugged in uh, 1 for x. So you can get six. So, but uh, one. Did you get six? Oh yeah. Right. We plug in. Plugged in uh, three point 
my board then, or whatever it is. So you plug in something like that, it's kind of nice that you plug in. Well, we have to plug into that green function to get a six. Is that right? You have to plug in a zero. You have to plug in a zero. Yeah. Do you think he plugged in zero? y-intercept and the slope, yeah. right? If you plugged in zero, he would be correct, right? He could plug in zero and get six. Now that, but it's going to give him the y-intercept, right? Yeah, but doesn't that not correlate with the other thing? If you plug in zero for x, ah. zero does not, uh, is not greater than four, so he would have to use the other one. Well, Let's say that someone did plug in zero into the green function. Now, that, you're not supposed to do that, right? That's not in keeping with the piecewise function. But that doesn't mean they can't help me graph the graph. What if I did do that? What if I did find the y-intercept at 6, and then draw this guy out with his slope? Is that yeah. useful? Yeah. Yeah, that is the correct graph for negative 3 fourths x plus 6. Negative 3 fourths x plus 6. Mm. What's the problem with it? Um, but yeah, when you have to erase whatever stuff is on the other on there the left yeah. side, and then just put your dot right where it hits four. There you go. The graph is absolutely correct for y equals negative three fourths x plus six. And of course, we want to graph that graph correctly. We just aren't supposed to graph all of that graph, right? As as Tyler just said, we would have to erase all of this stuff, right? And then put a point right there. You see what just happened? Yes? No? Yeah? Okay. That, that stuff over there, that is part of this graph. It's just that for the function overall, we're not supposed to graph this function for any value of x that's less than 4. Only for values of x that are 4 or greater than 4. So then I can just take this guy, extend it out. All right, there you go. Know, that is the correct graph. I can do a similar thing with this guy right here, right? This is, what does this open blue circle represent? Yeah? You know, it represents that it's not equal to 4 is just so Okay, that's what the openness represents. But I mean that it is at negative 5. What does that represent? It's at y is negative 5. It's again, the, he's mistakenly graphed the, the border y as the y-axis, the, the y-intercept on the border. Right. Exactly. Now, so that thing is the, the y-intercept. So why don't I just put it on the y-axis? Okay, on the y-axis, over here. All right. Do I need to like erase some stuff? No. You just need to add, uh, add more to the line. I just need to extend it out to x is 4. Does it only keep following the slope until it hits the dot? Yeah, I mean, this, the, that blue function there, three, 5 has x minus 5, it goes for infinity in both directions. Right? But in the case of this piecewise function, it only keeps going until it gets to x is positive 4. So technically, it, do, and it doesn't go infinity in both directions? So no, only in the left direction. So I, don't, I don't want this open circle here. It goes through its y-intercept like it should. So here's my open circle. and how we can graph these piecewise functions. These, these functions, this blue one and this green one, they, I mean, if you were to graph those lines, they, they, it's the same. If I were to just graph 5 halves x minus 5, I would graph a line with a negative 5 y-intercept and a slope of 5 halves. It's 
you just said with a piecewise function, it doesn't go for infinity in both directions. Part of it is cut off. So, um, is that just like looking at somebody else's common mistake that, that quite a few of you are making? Uh, we'll have to see. Another quick thing. Um, uh, if I'm at x is 4, I can find a point on that border and then follow the slope from there rather than the y-intercept because I'm not on the y-axis. For this blue function, how would I find out what the y-value of the blue function is at 4? It's the y-value of the blue function at 4. I haven't figured that out. Value I'm talking about now is 4. So 5 halves times 4 minus 5. Cancel. Cancel. We get 10 minus 5. That's 5. Right? So we get the point 4, comma 5 for this blue function. When I graph that point, I'm going I'm, I'm to graph it as a open circle. Okay? And you can see it's kind of drawn over it, but that guy's at 4, 5. Same thing for the green function. I can plug in 4 into that to see where it lands on this border. Okay. So negative 3 fourths times 4 plus 6. Canceling, negative 3 plus 6, that's 3. So you get the point 4, comma 3. We are supposed to plug 4 into this function for the piecewise function. So we'll get a closed circle at 4, 3. You can see it's at 4, 3. For the blue, yeah, you plugged in uh, four, uh, four. Yep. So how can you do that? And it, it has to be uh, less than four. Right. So the graph that I graph, like the closed points that I graph, will only be for x's that are less than four. Okay. But I plugged four into it because this line would go through four comma five. Okay. When I go to four comma five, I just put an open circle so that I can represent what you're saying that you're not supposed to plug 4 into this function. When I get to 4, I don't actually want to include this point in the graph. Okay. But it is helpful to say, well, that is a point that, you know, I should So you can plug something in, and uh, you can plug uh, 4 into it, even though it doesn't uh, correlate with, the, uh, with right. the function and stuff like that. You can still put it in there. You just got to remember not to add it on to your graph. Yeah, don't include that point. Include an open circle. It's just a, like a target. Okay. So I can find those points on the on the border there and just follow the slope like I would if, as if it was the, the y-intercept. Yeah, that's just more or less a visual thing when you put the open circle on the six. Six. Five is erased. as good as it could be, I guess. The, the open circle, maybe I can move it down closer to five. But if you if you show me that you are trying to put the y-intercept and follow a slope of, of five over two, or two over five over two, really, really close, like the, my actual drawing may throw it off a bit. Okay, so now we're solving this absolute value equation. Linda has done it incorrectly. Okay. So should be, if you see how it's done correctly, you should be grading that on the quiz, but you should also be in your notes taking note of what are some common mistakes? Did I make this mistake? Do I want to leave a little note for myself to not make this mistake in the future? So this is a really common thing I'm seeing. I'm not sure exactly why it happened. Swinging for the fences here, hoping that what we do is working. It's also a 
before doing the step in red, you see that plus 17 is in red. What should Linda have done? She should have taken like negative three minus two. Negative three minus two. Why negative three minus two? She wants to get No, that's not quite what I'm getting at here. That's you want to take it and balance it to where it's, it's inside the absolute uh, value against what's out there normally and the opposite of what's out there. Right. So like you want to write the equation without the absolute values. It's it's impossible to solve with the absolute values around it. We have to interpret what the absolute value means. Okay? So the stuff inside the absolute value like this, the stuff inside could be equal to this stuff. There we go. It's leaving the absolute values around one side of the equation that I'm addressing here. It doesn't, it just does not make any sense. You, ca you cannot bring things outside of the absolute value like that. You have to write an equation that does not include absolute value signs. So that stuff inside of the absolute value could be equal to 3x minus 3, and then we can solve it. And we can take the exact steps that Linda has taken, except that at the end, we still get negative x equals 14, so x equals negative 14, now we're going to the absolute value of negative x. So Linda's only done about half of this problem. What does Linda still need to do? Check work. You're going to check your work. And do the opposite. Yeah, you've got to do both of those things. So check your work, check your solution, and also do the opposite. Okay? So she has to do this equation, opposite of the other side, solve that, and also check solution. Okay? So we look again. Uh, Linda has done some things correctly, but overall she's not completely correct. The step in blue is correct. Why has Linda done this? This step in blue. Justin? Because that blue says so she would have to take the other side. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's just the other possibility. Right? Remember that absolute values, the set inside the absolute value, could be positive, could be negative. Set it equal to the positive right side and the negative right side. So we have to look at both of those possibilities. If we don't do that other part, we're only finding half of the possibilities. It seems like this question it should become audible, otherwise it can't help. Formulate your question. Say it out loud. Um, so we have to set the stuff inside the absolute value equal to the positive right side, the negative right side. It's set equal to the right side, set equal to the opposite of the right side. And we solve both of those equations. Okay. To find all solutions. When doing the blue step, students often make mistakes. What's one mistake you think is made in that? Well, I turned it to negative 3 plus, negative 3x plus 3. That's okay. That's just distributing yeah. the negative. So that's the that's same. Blue they were just oh, two okay. negative reactions. I just mean, like, on the blue part, that's what I did. Oh, just like instead of putting a negative? Yeah. She just so if you just switch the signs, negative, positive. So that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, because that's what putting a negative in front will do. It will switch the signs and everything. That's fine. That's not a mistake. That won't lead you. That won't be something that leads you to the incorrect solution. Someone might just put the negative on the x value and not just on the, the first thing, yeah. or the just the second, I guess. Or just the second. Yeah, I see that most often. I see equals negative three x minus three, or equals three uh, x, and they only make the number the opposite. 
So those are the two most common mistakes that I see. Just putting the negative either on the x or on the, uh, the number itself, just the constant, it needs to be the opposite of everything you see on the right side. And then she has to do one more thing. What does she need to do? Check her. Check her solution. And how does she do that? Plug in uh, like 4 for x. Plug in 4 for x. Negative 14. Plug in negative 14 for x. And whatever one comes out to where they're it works out. If it works out, that solution is correct. Let's go, so let's check it. You got two. That's true. I'm not sure if everybody is catching on to that when I say it. So I'm going to put it into both sides and show you why you do only need to plug it in to the left side. All right, the absolute value of this is negative uh, 28 minus 17. That's negative 30. Five equals three times negative fourteen, negative negative forty-two. Yeah, it seems like yeah. Minus three. Okay, so something's wrong though, Abby. Yeah. What's you wrong? You can't have a negative on the right side. Of you can't have a negative on the right side. Why not? Because absolute value is always positive. Absolute value is always positive. You want to go long, long distance. I got it. Wow, good thing nobody was thinking about that. Yeah, you <laughs> cannot take the absolute value of a number and get a negative number. Absolute values are always positive. What does that mean? What does that mean? Not this, not not not. this is not possible. This is not a possible solution. It doesn't mean it's not valid. It's extraneous. It's no good. Okay? Let's plug in four. Now we realize what Justin is saying, which is what? You only have to put it in the right side. Right? We know that both sides are going to come out the way we want them to. When we plug in four, we know that we're going to get a number here and the opposite of that number on the right side. That's the equation we set up. But that will only work if the right side is positive. So we just check the right side. Will the right side come out positive if I put 4 in there? Yes. Yeah, 3 times 4 is 12 minus 3 is 9. So it works. The right side is positive. You can bet that the inside of the absolute value is going to be negative 9. That's how we set up this equation. This side is going to be the opposite of this side. This side is 9, so this side will be negative 9. So, this one works. It's a valid solution. Make sure that you are setting up this other equation and that you're checking your solution. And that is all. So, if there's any questions, ask. If not, tally the points. Pass it back. Pass it back. Rich, miles per hour with strides, that's going to be the first thing you see. Let's check you out. What are we looking at here? What are we topping out? 16.0? All right, here we have Rich versus Julio Jones. Full spin. <laughs>
Faster does Julio go than yeah. suit? The suit guy? Yeah. Oh, it's his official name, the suit guy. Okay. Here, maybe, uh, maybe I need to, to write these down a little bit, guys. Realize you've asked them already. How much faster? How much faster is Julio than the suit guy? That's just a question of the distance, the difference between the two of their speeds. Yeah. What's the difference between strides that each person takes? The difference in strides. Okay. Fast, fastest speed constantly, how long would it take him to run around the circumference of the world? Ooh. That's a big question. <laughs> uh, you know that's good. Um, <laughs> for Julio to run around the earth. Right now we have to find the circumference of the earth. Well, <laughs> we can look it up. We can look up. <laughs> that is speed. That's an around the earth, you're running a, a what's called a great circle, which is at an equator. A great circle. And the center is at the center of the earth. Anyway, what's another question we could ask? For every like, yard that the guy in the suit runs, how many yards do you do? Okay. We're asking a lot of questions about what's the com what, what's a comparison, whether it be a difference or a ratio or right, that kind of thing. How many, how many yards can... Julio run versus how many yards does he run? Or for every one yard that he runs, how many yards does he run? You know, that's a, a ratio. It's really just a comparison of their two speeds. What's the equation that if he goes, or uh, what's a uh, suit guy if he goes 10 yards compared to Julio when he goes 10 yards? Uh, really just comparing their distances. It's not much of an equation, it's just something you would measure how far they go uh, in what? 10 yards? Yeah. How long it takes each one of them to go 10 yards? So, like, uh, how about the time? The uh, time it gets oh, sure. 10 yards. How well, you know, much time it takes to go 10 yards? These are all things we can measure, right? I can Warm just clock and go up. Stopwatch. 
start, stop. Yeah. Right? What's a question that we like to gather information and ask or answer the question? If yes. Mr. Sukai was to continue, how much, how fast would he continually be growing at? What was Bro, what do you mean? How much would he accelerate? <laughs> how much would he accelerate? <laughs> If he just kept getting faster and faster and faster? At that well, acceleration. Too, well, where it is. It almost seems like a graph. Yeah. 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 Like what uh, Julio and stuff. Uh, it, uh, Julio, uh, like how fast would it, uh, if he kept going faster and faster by uh, one mile per second, uh, how uh, how many seconds would it take before he reaches the same uh, speed as Julio? Oh. Well, that's a pretty sure. Um, how? No way. One uh, mile per hour per second. Um, I was thinking maybe like if they could both run at top speed the whole time, how long would it take for Julio to get a mile away from Sukit? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we, it, it helps a lot in these questions that, to assume some constants, like they'll just always run the same speed and that kind of thing. If you want to be in a, on an algebra level and, uh, and linear functions, right? So if they run the same speed, running, um, consistent speeds, uh, time equals what when Julio is one mile We'll just say ahead. Ahead of what? That's implied. Constant number of strides related to the speed that they're running. How does the number of strides? had more of a head start than that, then he would win, right? Good question. Um, this is a bit of a, I'm just curious, if you were to do their time and their distance, would you be able to find out how far, or also how many strides they do, could you find out how far they go with each stride? On yeah, all these things are related. If I knew how many strides it took, how many, how far you went, then I could Take the distance divided by the number of strides, or how long the stride was. Like, you know, mix and match all that information in lots of different ways. And find like how hard each stride. Yeah. Justice. If Sukai continually accelerated the uh, same uh, amount per second, yeah, how many seconds would it take him to reach the same speed as Julio? Uh, okay. Well, then are we assuming that Julio is not accelerating? Yeah, only already, suit guys accelerating is and Julio's not accelerating. Julio already reached his speed. Okay. So uh, if the if if suit guy could continue to accelerate accelerate how long until his speed matches Assuming it's an even acceleration, like one mile per hour faster each second. So yeah. Uh, well, what I'm gonna be biased here. I'm gonna pick the question that I want to ask. Okay. And be because it fits what we're trying to learn. Okay. But it is the question when I watch this video that occurred to me. 
right? How much of a head start would the suit guy need in order for there to reach, say, 50 yards at the same time? How much of a head start would he need? How many yards would he need to head start up? Okay. Um, so what information do we need? What's the next, what's the next act? Julio's speed. speed. Julio's speed. Okay, so let's say S for speed and uh, S of J for Julio's Suit guy speed. So we need speed of suit guy. Okay. So and in content, the first is yardage. Or yardage where they're going to, like eight. Okay, we just gotta agreed upon how far they're gonna run. Let's say they run 50 yards. That's something we can just decide. Because they do, they do go to 50 yards. I think that's what they're showing, the 50 yard dash or whatever. So they're both gonna run 50 yards. And when we'll assume the speeds are just like from the very instant that they start to the to the instant that they stop, we'll assume that their speeds are the same, right? So what do we need to know beyond that? Anything? Nothing that would really potentially change the the uh, answers that are functioning like that. Okay. Well, okay, let's make this even a little easier. Let's call this guy A and this one B. Let's say also that the suit guy gets, uh, he's going to get a head start, right? Mm -hmm. Head start of X yards. So in our notes, let's write now. Let's see if we can write equations for suit guy and for Julio. Right. Equations like y and x, and of course involving a, that's Julio's speed, and b, that's the suit guy's speed. Okay. So write equations that would tell me how much, um, let's see. We need to add them in both uh, in the same uh, in the same function or two separate functions. Say again. We need to uh, put uh, a in, uh, like um, Julio's and, and suit guys. Uh, do you want them in the both in the same function or do you want them in two separate functions? Two separate functions. To tell me. Um, let's see. Both. Tell me how long it's going to take to go 50 yards. Okay, yeah? You can't know what Julio's is until we figure out his speed. Right. So we need to put it like. We'll, make, we'll let, his, let A stand in for the speed. So we write an equation and then when we know A, we plug A in. Yes. Yeah. But first you need to know, know what uh, it takes. So you need to know, like, what does it take to, uh, his speed to go to 10 yards? Yard. Well, we'll find the speed in a bit. So what like I'm saying long, is, how long it take knowing or, or assuming that we do know his speed, which is treating it as treating a as his speed, let's put that into an equation that would tell us how long it would take for him to go 50 yards. Yeah. A over a over 50 yards equals b plus x. I want two separate equations. I want y equals, now y is the time that it takes, okay, time that it takes, is that making sense, okay, so uh, we want to give Sukai a head start of a certain number of yards, okay, and with a head start of a certain number of yards, write an equation okay. for all this stuff. When I plug in my x and my b, it'll tell me how long it takes him to go that distance. Okay. I want you to work on. Which piece of 
paper and a pencil, okay, or a pen maybe.